Hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Richard Wiseman. <laughs> okay, so we're both obviously part of the UK data service based here at the University of Manchester. So today we're going to tell you a little bit about the service and what we do, give an overview of everything. Um, so here's the contents of our presentation. So we'll tell you what the UK data service and who it's is for, um, sort of data that's available and the resources, um, a little bit about the data. Um, about how the UK data service can help you, and that's our web address there at the bottom, which is where you need to go to find the data. So what is the UK data service? It's a comprehensive resource funded by the ESRC, and um, it's made up of the old services ESDS, census.ac.uk, and the secure data service. So I'm not sure if any of you are aware of them, but that's the old services that have now all come together into this brand new service. Uh, it's a single point of access to a wide range of secondary social science data and it can be all found on our website. And we have a range of data sources and as well as the data we provide support, training and guidance. And it's important to let you know that the data comes to us from all different places, so from census, from the surveys, from the government sources, and what we do is we take in that data, we make it more usable, and we put it all on our site so you can just download the data and do wonderful things with it. So here's our website, um, and we're going to, that's the URL there, so we're going to be talking a lot about stuff that you can find in the get data section so that's kind of a really good way into the data so if you click on that button and we launched the website back in March and it's growing all the time but so if you click on the get data section and we're going to use this as the basis of our presentation basically so we're going to talk about UK surveys, cross national surveys, longitudinal, census data, international macro data business micro data and qualitative data. So who's it for? Well it's for anyone really. Um, so we've listed some of our audience members here, so academic researchers, government analysts, consultants, think tanks, so anyone can use our data. Some of it has some of the data has restrictions on who can do it, but a lot of it doesn't. And that's all, if you look in the website, that should all be quite clear. And here's a list of our main data types. I'm going to talk about aggregate data, so I'll tell you what that is a little bit later, but I'll be telling you about the macro data and the UK census data. And you can also divide it into micro data, so you've got a list of, which um, mainly Sarah will be talking about different types of micro data. And we've also got other data as well, such as qualitative and mixed methods. So first of all, I'm going to tell you about the international macro data. So this is time series data aggregated mostly to a country level, but also to a regional level. Um, and the data can be cover quite long time series, so in some cases it goes back as all the way back to the 1930s. The data can be, most of it's annual data, but we do have some quarterly and monthly data as well. It's regularly updated, so we update some of the data every single month, so some of the series will get expanded and we'll update it. Um, the data um, comes in from all different sources, from international governmental organisations, such as the IMF, OECD, the IEA and the World Bank, for example. And it covers a wide range of socio-economic topics, so such as economics, um, labour, trade, migration, a whole host of things. The data, most of this data is only available to staff and students from UK institutions, um, higher and further education institutions rather. But the World Bank data is open to anyone, so anyone can access that without any need to log in. And oh, I don't know if you'll be able to quite see this, but here's a screen dump from our interface UKDS.stat where you can download the data. So if you downloaded the data, and here you can see foreign direct investment, that's the subject right at the top. Downside here, you can see all the different countries. At the top is the years, and if you scroll down, you'll see further years and so 
to run that. So you can pick the actual data you want. You can display more than this subject. And the good thing is you can um, you can change the dimensions around. So if you wanted the countries at the top, if you wanted to display more than one series, you can do that. So it's very versatile. Um, here's an example of some data from the IMF International Financial Statistics that shows net claims on the Euro system. Um, this shows the falling confidence in the Greek um, Euro system banking crisis. Um, so you can get this chart from, you can download data basically, this is what it would look like. Here's some more data from our UKDS.stat interface. Um, um, this shows the portion of seats held by women in national parliaments. So it's all, you can see all the data is mapped, and you can do this in the interface itself, which is really great. Uh, the countries in red, sort of the Scandinavian countries, and some of the African countries have a, higher, have a higher proportion of women in national parliaments. And what's really good is you can easily do this within our interface, and create a map on the fly and it takes no time at all, you know, you need no specialist knowledge, it's really simple to do. Okay, at this point, I'm handing over to my colleague Sarah. So, um, Richard has told us so far about uh, aggregate data, so these are data that's at a, a national level for the most part. Um, so, um, I'm going to tell you a bit about microdata. Now, microdata basically is data that's um, at the individual or household level. It can be at other levels, but it's generally, in this instance, those sorts of levels. Um, so, basically, um, when you see these sorts of data, they will have been anonymised. You don't, when you download our data, ever get people's names or their addresses or anything like that. It's always going to be just information about, say, their gender, their age, and the other things that they were asked about. Um, if you're going to look at microdata, it's the kind of thing that needs to be analysed using um, an analysis package like SPSS or Stata, that kind of thing. And these are actually a lot more flexible than a lot of macrodata because you can actually look at the relationships between different variables, for example. You can produce your own tables and you can decide on which proportion of the population, say, which part of the population you're interested in, say, women only, for example, or certain age ranges only. Um, right. This is what microdata look like. Um, what you see here, this is in SPSS, and what you see here in each of the rows is a person for this particular data set. So that's the information of the person um, on the second line for one of the people. And you can see each of the columns represents the information that you've got for each variable. So this is, for example, they were asked, you know, how old are you? This is their age, the person at the top, the age is 36, the second person in the highlight is 44, etc. Okay, so this is just an example of the kind of data I'm talking about. Okay, so just to finish the international theme first, um, we have some international data sets that are microdata. Um, so these are studies that use the same survey instrument, I the same kind of questionnaire, um, in a whole load of different countries. And where possible, they tend to ask the same questions and use the same methods. So this is quite nice comparative stuff across different nations. And we do hold several surveys of this kind in our archive, but we quite a lot of these, I think, I don't know how many there are, there are probably only about seven or eight of these that are advertised as, as being series on, on our website, but we will direct you to the, the archives where they're held if we don't ourselves hold them. Um, examples of these are the um, what is it, European Social Survey, that kind of thing. It covers a whole load of different countries, and so you can actually use it to compare from one country to another. Um, we have a large number of UK surveys. These are ones that are mostly produced by the government or on behalf of the government, the UK government. Again, these sorts of survey data are um, individual level or household level, sometimes family or other levels. And they are produced by organisations like the Office for National Statistics, who are very experienced research organisations who have paid a lot of money to produce these sorts of data, so they're very reliable. Um, they tend to be nationally representative and they have very large samples. The samples can vary from a few thousand, maybe each year, if they're done every year. Um, one of our surveys is called the Labour Force Survey, and that actually interviews 60,000 people every quarter. So some of these are very large surveys indeed. Um, these are called repeated cross-sectional surveys, so that means that each time it's run, they get a different sample of people. 
Okay, so they don't follow people over time, they just get a new sample of people each time it's run, although they might ask the same questions, it will be different people. Um, and as I say, many of these surveys are actually repeated every year, so you can get long time series of information. Okay, and they cover a lot of topics, so for example, health, work, crime, social attitudes, etc. And here are some examples of these surveys. So we've got the crime survey for England and Wales, it's pretty self-explanatory, I think. Labour force survey, that's the really big survey that, that a lot of people use, and that's obviously all about people's working conditions and how they work and the hours that they work and that kind of thing. Um, social attitude survey, the health survey for England, there's also one for Scotland. We have some surveys that are just for Wales, say, or just for Scotland. Some of them are for the whole of the UK. You know, it depends on the particular survey. Okay, and as an example of the kinds of things that you can do with these kinds of survey information, this is just uh, shows the trend in domestic burglary. Now you can see that what we've got is the British Crime Survey, as it used to be called, started in 1981, and these data go up to 2011-2012. And this tells us about the um, trends in domestic burglary over that time period. So you can actually see that it went up considerably in the mid-1990s and then it came down considerably since then. But these sorts of statistics are also used by government to inform their policy decisions. Okay, um, now another kind of UK survey data is longitudinal studies. Um, these are similar to what I just told you about in the sense that they tend to be at the individual or household level. Um, they are they have very large samples, they're nationally representative and they're often repeated, well they are repeated and often annually repeated. But the reason why they're called longitudinal and why they're different from the ones I was just talking about is because they actually do follow individuals over time. So they'll ask the same people the same questions over proportion, over, over time. So instead of seeing aggregate change, so within a whole population, those are really good for looking at individual change. Okay. So here's the, the big ones really, is the British Household Panel Survey and Understanding Society. Understanding Society was only launched in 2009, but British Household Panel Survey started in uh, 1991. So it, has to be have, it was done every year, so there's 18 ways of that. And the BHPS sample was included in the new Understanding Society survey from its second wave. So you have actually got quite a lot of time series for that particular one. And we have other longitudinal surveys. So there's one about um, ageing, families and children, growing up in Scotland, and a study of young people in England. Just some examples. Um, you'll see on... Um, on, if you go on to the Guardian or other websites, you'll often see um, information that's actually come directly from our data. We wouldn't have produced this information that has gone up. We just provide the data and you would produce the, the reports that might go into the media or academics might produce the reports or the government might produce the reports. But you can see that these data are very, very widely used, um, and not just by government, but also to inform you know, every, every ordinary people about what's going on really with, with um, trends in the UK. Um, another kind of longitudinal study um, is one called cohort study. Um, these are where they've taken a group of individuals who are born in the same week in the same year and followed them over time. So it's just a single cohort that's followed. And there are three large ones. There's the 1958 one, 1970 and 2000 one. These are quite interesting because you can follow the individuals over time but because you're looking at people who are born at different time points and so are affected in different ways possibly by the different circumstances, different you know, changes in education, these kinds of things, you can actually look at differences between the different cohorts, so look at generational change. Um, these tend to be about head of health and they tend to have a medical focus, but they also would have a lot of social and economic information. Um, I should think so, I should think so. They, they, sometimes what they do is probably to save money and time because if you ask people too long, too many questions, then you might end up, you know, people get fed up and they, they sort of say, oh no, I've had enough. But to what they do sometimes is they might ask um, the same, a number of questions the same every time and other ones that sort of come in and out. So you might ask about a certain thing every five years or, or however, you know, every time they do the survey, every fifth time maybe or whatever. Yeah. Okay, and now over to Richard for the UK census. Thank you.
So next I'll talk about the UK census data. Uh, so the census has a really long history going back to 1801 and we hold um, data within the UK data service for the last five censuses, so 1971 to, to 2011, depending on the outputs. Uh, it's considered the gold standard because it it's aims to be 100% coverage of everyone, so it's basically an enormous survey which with an enormous population. As such, it's used as a baseline for many other statistics um, because of the real high quality of it. It has really detailed combinations of characteristics. Um, and because it's such a huge um, sample, it, you, can go, you can get data down to really small geographies, which is something really unique with the census. And you can reliably compare these geographies because they've all been asked the same questions between different areas as well, which is useful. And it goes right down to output area level, which is, I think the recommendation is about 150 households, so, that, so small areas. So there's several census outputs that I'm going to talk about. There's the aggregate data, there's boundary, flow and micro data. Um, much of the census data is restricted to UK higher and further education staff and students, but there is some exceptions. The micro data has different rules depending on the data and it'll say stuff on our website if you're interested in that. And the aggregate data through Infuse, which is one of our applications, is now openly available. So there's 2001 and 2011 data, which is open to all. But uh, if you're from the UK FEHE institution, you can access anything. So here's just a list of some of the topics. So I um, guess if, if you were here in 2011, you may have filled in this form yourself. Um, so some of them that come up every single time is age, sex, and, and there's other data about um, questions about health, but it's quite coarse ones. So if you're in good health, bad health, that's very, very coarse. Um, religion, which is an optional question, or at least it has been the last couple of censuses. Um, ethnicity, there's, there's questions about caring, travel to work, car ownership, and all sorts of things. So it covers a wide range of topics. But the census um, is really to do with the needs of the time. So questions change each year. Some are added, some are dropped, some, some of the categories change, for instance. So in the 2011 census, there was new questions concerning national identity, if you feel that you're British or English or both. Um, data to do, questions rather to do with if you have second poems and what they were, and there's questions to do with the intention to stay, because there's a real big focus on immigration of the present government. Here's our website. We have our own part of the UK Data Service website, and it has all that you'd expect, um, but the, the most um, useful part is probably to get the census data, where you can see all the different outputs in there, and the new census data, and that um, contains things like the actual question, the forms, and the definitions, and there's guides in there as well, so it's worth taking a look. So now I'm going to tell you about the different outputs. So. Census aggregate data, so we talked already a little bit about aggregate, aggregate data. For the census, it counts usually of people and households, but there is a few other ones, with particular characteristics uh, or combinations of characteristics for an area. And the areas, as I mentioned earlier, vary from very large, like up to UK level, down to very small areas, and things like wards, districts, counties, and so on. Um, so an example of aggregate data is the number of females aged 30 to 34 who are married and live in private rented accommodation in the county of Cheshire. And that's just at the bottom here. So we have 1971 to 2011 census aggregate data. Um, through We've got two interfaces, CASWeb, but our newer one, Infuse is where we're sort of going. And Infuse at the moment just has 2001 and 2011 English and Welsh data. And here's just a visual representation of what aggregate data is. So if you looked, if you looked over at the land and you could just um, cut it up into different areas, and then you counted the people who lived in those areas. So here there's 17 females, 
35 females here, 59 females, and that's all aggregate data is. And here's an example if you downloaded the data through one of our interfaces, um, and this is, um, this is a table on religion, and you can see the geography is down here, side, and at the top is the, um, is the different topics, and here you can see that there are four, 48 people, rather, age 16 to 24, who follow the religion, the Muslim religion, living in Carlisle. Okay, so another outputs we have is census boundary data. So I've already said that census data comes at lots of different geographical levels. So, and here's just some of them represented here. Now, you can download, if you have a little bit of GIS experience on the software, you can download these boundaries and create maps just like this. But the boundary data becomes a lot more interesting when you mix it in with the aggregate data, for instance. And so here's two maps. This one here is the 2001, and this is just England and Wales, obviously. And there's the 2011 map. And this is mapping the percentage of Christians in both censuses. And you can see that over time, in the 2011 census, there were lots of people reporting following the Christian religion. And you can do that with any of the data. You can create your own maps just like that. Uh, we also have other data called census flow data, which um, sometimes is referred to as interaction data. So this um, special type of aggregate data, again, where it has an origin and a destination, and there's two main types. There's commuting, which tells you the difference between a place of residence and a place of work. So that's kind of calculated by postcodes, by what you put in your census form. And migration, which is derived from the place of residence at census day, compared with your usual residence of the, in the previous year. So again, in, in the census form, people were asked where did they live the year before, so that's how that was calculated. We also had census microdata, and Sarah's talked a lot about microdata. So um, for the census, it's individual level data which has been anonymized to prevent disclosure. And that's a key thing. The census is, um, there's lots of confidentiality it's confidential for 100 years, but this data has been anonymized. And it varies in, I think it's 1 to 5% as the sample, and it's also known as the sample of anonymized records. Again, microdata, as Sarah was already saying, it looks like the data you'd get yourself if you're doing your own survey. You can analyze it in something like SPSS, the Sparta. Very flexible, so you can produce your own tables, populations, and attributes. And we do have, um, we don't go as far back as 1991 for this data. We have 2001, and the 2011 data is expected. Um, some of it's starting to come through by the end of the year, although that's not 100% definite, but most of it will be coming in 2014. So now, I'll come back to Sarah. I'm going to cover quickly the final two kinds of data that we have available. So first of all, we don't just have quantitative data, we do have qualitative and mixed methods data. Um, so qualitative data is the data that you might derive from in-depth interviews or semi-structured interviews, focus groups, all these sorts of things, oral histories, all sorts of things, say diaries. Um, and those are available also to download from our website. So just a couple of examples of the kind of thing that you might find. There's one about indirect harm and positive consequences associated with cannabis use in the early 2000s. And chief probation officers of criminal justice elite, also from the early 2000s. Um, and the final kind of data we have are business microdata. So these data are um, at the business level. Um, so they're collected through a wide range of surveys and some administrative sources. And they cover business-related things like productivity, innovation, workforce skills, all these sorts of things. And because almost all are collected using the sampling frame um, of the Interdepartmental Business Register, it means that you can actually link these, these surveys together quite easily. Um, these data are only available by secure access, so they're quite hard to get your hands on, I should say. I'll explain what that means next. So basically our access conditions. Now, 
Anybody who wants to can go on our website and register for the data. And if you're not using the data for, um, for commercial purposes, so you're just using it for research purposes, then it's free to download. Not all of it can be downloaded immediately, though. Almost all of our data are caught um, under end user license. So what this means is that um, you, by agreeing to the end user license, you're promising that you're not going to misuse the data by giving it to other people who don't have the right to have it, for example. You're not going to try and identify people using the data, that kind of thing. Okay? And almost all of our data are obtainable in that way. Um, you can download that kind of data from the website, and I'll show you how the website works in a moment. Um, you can obtain a username and password. Um, if you're actually already at a university, which I guess probably you all are, you can just use your university username and password on our website. You do still have to register, but it's a very short process. There are two other kinds, well, there are other kinds of data that you'll see um, just occasionally. Um, there are, for example, data that you don't need to be registered for, registered for at all. Um, most of that is teaching data, so this is for people who actually want to be able to use a small data set, just a subset of one of the large data sets that we've got, in order to teach, say, A-level or undergraduates how to use SPSS. So we do have things like that. But almost all of our research data you would want to be registered for in order to get. We have two other kinds, though, to the, the main kinds of files, special license and secure access. So this is what I was talking about, the, the business microdata is first secure access. Special license files, you basically have to explain why you need those in order to get them. It takes about two to three weeks to get our special license data. Um, the reason why, what special license means effectively is that it's slightly potentially more disclosive than the end user license data. So none of these will have anybody's name or address or anything like that or postcode on it. However, special license files might include lower level geographies. It won't include very low level geographies like the kind that, that Richard was talking about. That would be far too low. But it might go down to sort of, I don't know, um, county level, that kind of thing. The point is that although it doesn't have people's names and addresses or anything on any of our data, if you say knew that a person had, say, eight children, was a particular ethnicity, did a particular job, lived in a particular part of Manchester, it's possible you might identify that person. And that's why these data are slightly more restricted. It's because if you have too much information, too many dis potentially disclosed variables together in one data set, then it's, you know, obviously they want to be more careful about who they give these data to. Um, so the special license one's slightly more potentially disclosed than the secure access data are potentially a lot more so. The secure access data, there's not that many of those, but the, those are, I mean, there's not, you know, you have to jump through a lot more hoops to get that kind of data. It's not to say that you can't get it, but it's, it's quite a lot harder. The vast majority of people who use our data do just download the end user license data because they don't actually need the extra variables that appear on special license or secure access data. Okay, and just one final comment about um, these sorts of data, basically. On our website, you will see that there's a lot of information about all of our data sets and um, what we call documentation. So things like questionnaires, user guides, um, technical reports, that kind of thing. And it's very important that you actually look at that because if you just download the data without bothering to read the documentation, then you don't know who supplied the data, you don't know the questions that they actually asked, you don't know exactly you know, what they did to the data in order to, you know, between collecting it and providing it to us. So it's very, very important that you read the documentation. It will tell you, as I said, exactly what questions were asked, who the questions were asked of, um, how the survey was conducted, and what was done with the raw data. And as I say, if you haven't looked at the documentation, then you don't understand the data. And that's pretty much true of all the data. Okay, and um, finally, getting more information and help. Obviously, you need to go to our website, and that's the address at the top. This will allow you to search for data, search for particular variables for surveys. Um, you can freely look at all of our documentation online, um, and you can also, for most of our data, download it. Um, we have links to other data providers and sources of statistics. And we also have case studies, so you can see how other people have used our data. Guides, which we've written to help people to use particular data sets or to use particular statistical packages like SPSS and Stata. And there are themed pages as well. Uh, I think we have one about crime, health, housing, and I think there's a fourth one, which I can't remember. Anyway, um, 
We also have events. We put on webinars and um, courses. The courses tend to be about, again, about our data and about how to use it. And we also have conferences as well. And finally, we actually have help pages and a help desk. So if you go onto our website and you have tried to find something and you're struggling or you're trying to register and you're struggling or if you've downloaded a data set and you've looked at the documentation but you simply can't understand what's going on, we do have a help desk and you just need to email us and we'll do our best to help you. Okay, so um, I was going to just show you the website. There we go, that's what the website looks like. Um, now what we've been looking at today is the different data types. So if you click on get data, can you see this? All right, yeah. Um, and go to key data. So this is the, um, the screenshot that Richard showed you earlier. You can see these are all different kinds of data that we've got. So UK surveys, these are the big government data I was talking about. Um, Cross-national, longitudinal, international census. So if you click on any of these, you'll see the key data if you scroll down the page. Um, I'll just talk about the UK surveys. If you scroll down, you'll see these are the most commonly used survey series. Um, if you want to know more about a particular survey, say I want to know about the annual population survey, all I do is click on that and it takes me through to a series page. And the series pages are all pretty much the same for survey data. You have a brief abstract. You have the data under data access where you can actually download it. There's going to be some frequently asked questions as well that are going to be added to these pages which should give you a bit more of an introduction to the, the general data series. And down at the bottom you've got related resources, so related studies, case studies and support guides. So to get the data and to find the documentation, you'll want to click either on the plus here, say, or on the particular data set you're interested in there. And they should appear. And I suggest that instead of just download ordering it there, that what you do is you just click on, say, there. This will take you to the catalogue page. The catalogue page, sorry, um, for this particular um, data set is here. Um, here's how you download and order it. You just click on there. I'll show you that in a moment. But I suggest before you do that, you'll want to have a look at the catalogue page a bit more thoroughly. The title details tell you who created the data. So if this data had been created by me, just me on my own, you might be a bit more concerned about whether this was good data. If it was created by, say, the Office of National Statistics, they've got a lot of very um, you know, well-paid people who are professionals in survey data, so you, know, you would trust that these are good data, therefore. So this is why it's important to look at you know, who did actually create the data. Um, you see the abstract has a summary. Again, there's lots of useful information in that. Um, this covers universal methodology. This has also got lots of interesting information. So it tells you um, when the field work was conducted, which country it was conducted in, um, who, who was asked, was it about individuals or households, for example, um, and various other things. And it tells you in this instance that there were 300,000 people who were interviewed. Okay. And then if we scroll down further, we see, this is probably the most important thing really, this is where all the documentation is. So this is the user guides, the questionnaires, all the information that you need to know in order to understand where the data have come from. And if, for example, we click on one of them, you'll see that almost all of them are PDFs, which means that they're searchable. So it's not as though you have to read every single word, you can select the things that you most want to find out about. So if I press Ctrl F, uh, search box comes up and I can search say for weight. Okay and here we are it brings up something about weighting so this is something that you do to survey data to um, use it properly and you can go and look for the next example of that. You could search for if I'm on the correct part of the, um, the documentation I could search for variables about something so say about health the next, yes, here we go. And this actually, um, do you know how to make it bigger on this computer? Mm. Mm, is it that one? Mm. 
Is it that? It's probably that one, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, I normally do something else. <laughs> so you can see here, the distance actually tells you exactly, exactly the information about where the data came from, what the question was, what the range of answers that were available were, what it's called in the data set. Okay, so this is the kind of information you can get. Okay. Um, and if you fail to find what you want in the first bit of documentation you download, you can just keep searching through because often they separate out of the different kinds of documentation. And at the bottom there's related studies and guides oh, and publications. So it's a selection of publications. But if I try to download the data, um, it will ask you to log in, which you will already have registered so you will have login details. Um, I already logged in earlier, so all I did was just put my username and password in and then pressed OK and that was it pretty much. So if I just want to download these data, I just do that, add data sets, and it's the one at the top, I think, and then press download. I'm saying that I accept the terms under which the NG is a license under which it's available. And then I can just double click, say, on SPSS to download it or save it. Okay, um, I'll just take us quickly back to the main page. Okay, so, so you can see there are other things on the website. Um, I should say that not all the pages look identical in terms of obtaining different kinds of data sources because obviously the, the things that Richard was talking about are slightly different, I think, in terms of, I mean, basically the same sorts of things apply and you should just be able to follow them through. Yeah, so when you're at the catalogue record and send that down, download, that's only the explore on the island, that's yeah. an internet application where you can choose the actual variables you want and the years and everything. Yeah. Um, so there are, you can search, look at these three things, things for yourself. Use data has information about how to use the data, so it's got various guides examples of how other people have used the data, how to set, cite data if you actually used it in the publication, and how to teach with it. Obviously there's also about how to manage data if you were collecting your own or if you're using our data. There's, I think, yes, things about ethics. Um, depositing data if you were to want to deposit data, but mostly it's, it's large organisations. And news and events, so you can find out about our courses there. And help up here if you click on that that takes you to um, our help pages where you can get in touch with us and you fill in a form if you have any queries about say you can't register you don't understand why it's not working or you're struggling with the data in some way or another and final thing is we have a, um, a way of searching our catalogue so you can find data that interests you so um, let's see social attitudes so say I wanted to find um, a survey about social attitudes, if I just type that in, what comes up here is anything that, that had social attitudes or that was related to social attitudes. Okay. And you can um, filter using the, the, top of the, the, um, the filter that side. You can also, this is using the variable and question bank, you can find variables that are about particular topics as well, so that's a different way of searching. Out, yes. Just be careful, the variables in question bank, just they only cover some data, it doesn't cover like, any of the census data or any international record data. Or something like that. It also currently yeah. doesn't cover some of the UK survey data, but it's because this was only launched in March and so it's slightly a work in progress, but um, it does cover a lot already. So if we search for, say, something about buses, um, yes, this has come up. So that's in the British election study in the general household survey. Okay, and I think that's it really. Is there anything she wants to add? Um, just go to the end of the just for seconds. Yeah, I'm just going to do a verification. Uh, no, just to, just because it's a little bit hidden, although it's kind of integrated in s different parts of the site, but if you wanted to see the census support site that I was talking to, you just click on that little link there and this would come up. So, so that's where you find all the census information, although there's lots of other ways you can get to it from the main site as well.